Hi guys, my name is Ryan and I'm the technical director here at Seven Church. I'd like to thank you for checking our videos out online. Uh, if you'd like to know more about who we are and what we're about, you can look us up at www.7sd.org. Or if you'd like to support our ministries financially, one easy way to do that is to text the amount you'd like to give to 7sd at mogive.com. Thanks again and enjoy the service. I want to preach a message to you today. We've entitled Joy in Trials. Joy in Trials. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write that down. If you're not taking notes, you should. Statistics show that people who take notes in church are 90% more spiritual. I made it up, but it might be true. I don't know. It could be true. But listen, when you have an older sibling, when you have an older sibling, you know they're going to mess up and you know they're going to mess you up. Like, you know they're just going to antagonize you and tease you and give you a hard time. And you know one thing for sure. You know they're not perfect. But the funny thing about the book of James is the guy who writes this book is not James the disciple of Jesus. It's James the brother of of Jesus, meaning this guy's older sibling, his older brother was the guy going around claiming to be the perfect one. For Jesus went around and said, here I am. I'm the Messiah. I'm the guy you've been waiting for for thousands of years. I'm here to save you. And there must have been days when James was like, you? No, there's no way. It can't be you. In fact, the Bible indicates that after Jesus had already appointed the 12 disciples, after he had already healed many people, after he had already preached that the kingdom was at hand and many people followed him, the Bible says this in Mark chapter 3, verse 21. It says, when his family heard all of those things, it says they went out to seize him by force, for they were saying he is out of his mind. Even his family didn't believe in him. For he was the Savior. He was the Son of God. And my question to you today is, have you forgotten who he is? When you forget who Jesus is in your life, you forget who you are. Who are you? What's your title? Where do you get your identity from first? And, and be honest with yourself. If somebody watched you live, who would they call you? What would they call you? Are you a career person? Are you a sports fan? Are you a fashionista, a tech person? Are you popular? Do you have success? Who are you? What makes you you, well, James writes this book, and he starts off with something very specific. And God must have done such a work in his heart, because just a few years later, in 41 AD, James writes this book of James. And that's encouraging to me, and that should be encouraging to somebody in here. This is a guy who doubted his whole life, didn't follow God his whole life. And in the last moments, God changes his heart and uses him to do a great thing, to write a book of the Bible. Can God use you? He doesn't care where you've been. He's so caught up in your future. A lot of times, we're so caught up in our past. He says, you got doubt today? I can handle it. It's fine. So James writes this book, and he starts out with this. I'm James, a servant of God. And that's pretty cool. But then he says, no, 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 not just that. I'm also a servant of my big brother, Jesus Christ. All right, Jesus Christ. By the way, Christ is not his last name. Right? It wasn't James Christ, Mary Christ, Jesus Christ. That's not his last name. Okay, Christ was a title, a function of who he was and what he did. He was the savior of the world. James says, I'm James. That's my name. But as for who I am, all you need to know is I'm a servant of my big brother Jesus, the Savior of all. That's who he was. That was, that was his identity. You know, whatever you allow that your title to be, who you are, that, that's your source. That's your source of joy, of filling. That's who you are. Are you, are you a business person? Are you someone that says, man, I'm just about success. I'm just about, the, you know, what I do in my life, how I look, my appearance. Who are you? And God wants to know who you are because he wants to tell you, he wants to tell you who you are. And what's so funny to me is I think that many of us in tonight, we wouldn't call ourselves a servant of, of God in here today. We wouldn't call us ourselves that. Because I think a lot of us would feel like that'd be prideful. Because you know where you've been. You know what you've done. Right? And, and the jury's still out on whether or not you, you think that you're actually amazing. You don't know if God's actually pleased with you because you're not kind of like that person next to you. You know that person next to you in church who prays really good? and like looks really good and sounds good, like they're nice. They do good stuff for God, but you don't know that when God looks at you, if he's as pleased as when he looks at them. Somebody like me looks over and sees somebody like John, and we get immensely jealous because it's somebody like John who's actually the one who's secure, who's actually the confident one. That's the free one, the one who can say, yeah, I'm just the one who Jesus loves. He loves me so much, I don't even care who knows it. I don't care who knows me. I just want you to know Jesus. To work all my life to earn worth and money and success. Why would I need to earn worth? Jesus won me all my worth at Calvary. 
Why would I need all the success and things this world has? I don't need that. I don't need that because I have his mercies. Did you know they're new every morning? Yeah, I'm free, and I don't care who knows it. I'm proud, not of me, but of my Savior. And here's the thing. This is how Jesus wants you to live. These are the thoughts that he wants you to have. For if I was to ask you the same question today, who is the disciple who Jesus loved? If you would say John, I'd say, no, it's you. You're the one. You're the one he's amazed with. You're the one that blows his mind. He's so happy when he looks down on you. He wants to be involved in every area of your life. He's got pictures of you up in his living room. He can't get enough of you. Yeah, that's you. And what that allows you to do is say, man, I'm not just a businessman or a success person. I'm not the flirty girl. My identity, my first title, and my source is that I'm the one who Jesus loves. I'm his servant. The Bible says, James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. What's various kinds? What does that mean? Well, it means this, fill in the blank. Whatever you struggle with today, you, if you think it's small or large, doesn't matter, God cares. I think too often in a church, we think our problems are too small for God. Like, you know what, today I'm just kind of struggling with some bills. I don't know how I'm going to pay them. You know, it's not really making me feel free. It's not really allowing me to be obedient and give to my church what God says. But you know what, that, that person's spouse is sick. God, just help them. I can handle this thing. That, that's bigger. Let's just do that. As if God's up in heaven rationing his power. Like he's about to run out. Right? We don't have a shortage of power today in church. we got a shortage of faith. As if God's up in heaven like, you know what, let's do it like this. Why don't we get in line? Okay, biggest problem to smallest. I'll handle you like that. That's not what he's saying. So you got a struggle today? Come to me. I care. I can handle it. I can take all of you at the same time. But then it says something even more ridiculous. It says, count it a joy when you go through fire. What? That makes no sense to me. I don't understand that. Why does he say that? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be honest with you today. The moment that you said yes, and some of you, hopefully in a few minutes, first service we, we had a ton, some of you are about to say yes to Jesus. And the moment you say yes to Jesus, that's the moment you entered into ministry. That was the moment that you walked on the spiritual battlefield of life. And let me tell you something. When God puts you on a battlefield, he equips you. He makes sure that you're ready. He makes sure that you have the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, passion, and an assignment. He gives you a calling. There's things that he gives you. And I think a lot of times, you know, we say, man, God's called me to do this thing. But you know what, God? I, I can't do it. You haven't given me what I need to do this thing. I can't start that small group, start that nonprofit, meet with that person. Invite. I can't do it. It's not who I am. And God says, man, I'm tired of hearing about what you don't have. Start talking about what I already gave you because everything you need to do, the thing I'm calling you to do, it's already in you. You have it. The devil's rightful place is being scared of what we have to offer. So here's what he does. He puts fire around your life. You know, it's interesting. Bad things happen to good people. But I think what's more interesting to me is that good things happen to bad people. Right? We all know people that are not in here today. They don't love Jesus. They don't follow God at all. And yet they're richer than we are. And they seem happier than us. It's like they're more free. Why do they get that? That's not fair. It's a bitter crit. Like, man, what? why do they get that, God? What's up with that? I'll tell you why. Okay, no offense to them, but they are not a factor. The devil is not afraid of them. They're friends. And so give them whatever they want. They're friends of darkness. And, and here's the reality. He doesn't need to put fire around their life because he's already set, the, he's already set fire inside their life. Their best days are now. Your best days are in forever or in eternity. My best friend in the world, he works with me at Skyline. He's a, he's a pastor on staff. His name's Alex Erlenbush. About a year and a half ago, right before we started our ministry, our, our young adult ministry, um, we came there, we're excited, we got this big assignment. A week before we started our first service, he gets diagnosed with cancer. He's 27 years old, he's probably the most healthy guy that I know. He said, man, I got kind of a you know, weird feeling in my stomach, I'm gonna go check it out. Cancer, cancer diagnosis. We did not understand why. It made no sense to us in the physical, we just didn't get it. And here's what happened. And by the way, this is what makes a church a church. We, we got together, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, and we prayed, and God completely healed him of cancer after he went through chemotherapy for four or five months. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's a good, that's a good thing. We should always clap for that, and we should always get excited and celebrate it. But here's the reality of the situation. His, his battle is not over. Every three months, he goes back to the doctor to get a CT scan. 
to see what? If his fire came back. What does that feel like? About a month ago, he come, we're at work, he comes to me, says, hey man, I, I, I can't focus, I'm terrified. He had a doctor's appointment the next day. He said, I got a pain in my lower stomach. And, and after you've had cancer, and you have a feeling, you don't know what it is, like, your mind just starts racing. I don't know what that feels like. He's just like, I got this thing, I don't know what it is. It turned out to be nothing, praise God, but at the time we didn't know. So he comes up and he's like, man, I'm terrified. What do I do? <laughs> I don't know. I got nothing for you, man. You know, you ever somebody come to you and you're like, dude, I got no answer. And so I started thinking of all these, you know, these Christian answers, like all these, all these verses I got memorized, well, the Bible says, and I'm like, you know, that's not going to help. It's just not. So we just sat there and I just asked God, give us something. Well, what happened was, is that Jesus walks into the room and the atmosphere changes. And what God showed us in that conversation blew our mind. We became in awe of the higher revelation that God was exposing to us. What came out of that conversation was this. I said, dude, God healed you of cancer? What an honor. The enemy touched your body with cancer? He must be so scared of you. There must be something huge that God wants to do in your, in your future. There must be something big on the horizon. But in the meantime, God's romancing you through cancer. And if you don't understand this whole, I'm the one that Jesus loves, that will make no sense to you. God is teaching you to rely on him in a deeper way, in a way that a blessing never could. For the beginning of the year, he wrote down one goal for this year. He said, God, take me deeper. And that's how God did it. That is how God did it. God was teaching him that he's not in control. You see, it's at the point that you're out of control in your life that God's in control. It's at the end of your humanity that you start following God spiritually. I said, man, the day the devil touched your life with cancer, he dug his own grave. Because what he used to break you, God uses to make you. God's making you. He's turning your life around. He's teaching you, come on, who he is. He's making you. He's giving you a secret weapon. Now you'll be able to love and reach people in a way you never, ever could. You ever see people in church that are just crazy? Like they're crazy passionate. They're kind of nuts. Why are you all looking at me right now? I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, they're nuts, man. They're like here all the time. They're, so, they're just so passionate. Well, here's usually why. Because they went through fire, but they're back. Yeah, the enemy messed with the wrong person. He tried to break them. Guess what? They're back, and they're twice as strong. They weren't going anywhere. And now you've got an edge, man. Oh, i got an edge today. I'm fired up. i got an edge. I'll tell you a quick example of my edge, my life in a nutshell. I grew up not going to church, broken family, messed up. It wasn't until I was 17 years old I walked into church and felt the presence of God, and all my questions in my life were answered in one moment. I don't know if you were like me. I grew up wondering, does anyone love me? Does my life matter at all? Do I have any purpose? Why am I here? And in one moment, in the presence of God. By the way, that's why I'm here. Right? Is that not why we do what we do? I don't do what I do because my theology is better and my knowledge is better and I just think God's like makes more sense. No, it's because he touched my life. And nobody can take that from you. That's a weapon. I, walk into God, I walked into church. God fills me. All my, all my questions were answered with one big yes. And years after that, I began to understand. God didn't take my family away from me. Listen, God doesn't give cancer. God doesn't do bad things to you. He doesn't punish. That's not who he is. He's not a punisher. He's a giver of life. He doesn't punish you. Sometimes he allows things to happen. I began to understand why. God, why did you allow my family to be taken away from me? Well, here's why. So here's my life in one line. God allowed my family to be taken away from me so that the only thing I'd want to do with the rest of my life is build God's family. That's it. So now, that's what I'm going to do or I'm going to die trying. That's all I got. I got an edge. And so here's what I want to do to close. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes. There's somebody in here today Say, man, I, I want to know this Jesus the way that you're talking about him. I want to know him in a personal way. I got some doubts. I, I know my life needs an answer. I know that something needs to change, but I don't know what it is, but I, I think it might be Jesus. Man, I, I want to give my life to him or recommit my life to him in a new way. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. Again, not to, to embarrass you. I'm not going to bring you up front. I just want to pray for you. That's it. So if that's you today, say, man, I'm just doubting. I want to give God my doubt. I want to walk with him in a new way. Would you just lift your hands just so I could pray for you in this place? Thank you, 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 thank you. Come on, just one more moment. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's hands all over the place. Let's, let's put them around and pray. God, thank you so much for these. People who are reaching up their hand and saying, God, I want to know. Show me who I am. Tell me who I am. Give me my identity. Come on, my identity comes from you. Not this world. The world has been telling us who we are since we were born. But God, who do you, you told us who we were before time began. We want to know who we are. 
Give us our identity back, God. Show us why we've gone through the things that we've gone through in life. Life's not about what's happened to us. It's about how we respond. And so, God, we respond right now. We say, we're giving you our doubts. We're trusting you. You just want a, a chance. So we give that to you right now. If anybody lift your hand, God, I, I just pray for them. I just pray they would know you're the realest thing in this life. There's nothing else in the world that comes close, that touches what you have to offer us. Because you made us. It's funny, isn't that funny? You know exactly what we need. Way better than we know what we need. And so we pray that we, we just come to you right now. God, fill us, show us who we are. I thank you for the people who lifted their I just pray that this week you'd show them who, who they are. They're taking a chance. They're saying, God, I'll, I'll give you my doubt. Show me. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you're so open and, and that you want to hear from us. You want to commune with us every day, not just Sunday. Come on, Monday through Saturday. And so, God, we love you so much. I'm thankful for this church. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. amen.